Good evening. Welcome, everyone, to the Immortality Institute Sunday evening chat. Tonight, we have a guest, a religious scholar, Dr. Kelvin Mercer. First, I want to start out with our weekly update from the Immortality Institute. We just got finished with our first official board meeting, the board members who were elected uh, this year having their first meeting, and uh, I introduced everyone last week, but I do have uh, I believe a picture here for everyone to see of the new board members for the Immortality Institute. Uh, we'll put up Dr. Mercer here so you can see uh, his picture. That is our guest for tonight. Here are our new board members for 2008. The chairperson recently elected, Shannon Veff, and our treasurer, Richard Lease. Congratulations. And our other five directors, Bruce Klein. Shane Greenup, Sebastian Seth, John Schlorendorn, of course, famous for his Lysosense research. Great job, John. And also, Kenneth Sills, longtime member and director, has done a wonderful job as chairperson, past chairperson, and on board. And I also want to thank, again, uh, Nate Allen, Justin Rebo, and Graham Smith for their service to the Immortality Institute over the last year. All right, back to... The view here. Also, this week uh, at the Immortality Institute, we've been discussing the Folding at Home Prize. We're going to uh, offer a prize for people who are uh, in the Folding at Home program, distributed computing. Hopefully, we can contribute to basic research through offering a prize, get more people excited about distributed computing. And at this point, I am going to bring in our guest. As I mentioned earlier, our guest tonight, Dr. Kelvin Mercer, a religious studies scholar at East Carolina University. Hello, Dr. Mercer. Uh, hello, Justin. Okay, well, it's wonderful that you could join us tonight. Of course, the Immortality Institute, very interested in uh, extreme life extension. And one thing that often comes up is the discussion of religion. So we would be uh, uh, very privileged to get your perspective on this tonight. And first off, I just want to uh, ask you if, if you could give us a brief uh, biography, uh, a few snippets of what uh, you have done in the past and what you are currently involved in. Uh, okay, Justin. Much of my scholarship in years back was a historical study of early Christianity and early Christian text. I also trained in clinical psychology and I worked for 10 years part-time as a therapist at, as I was uh, had a full-time university job. Um, out of that um, work as a clinician, um, I have uh, written a psychological interpretation of fundamentalism, fundamentalist Christians using a cognitive therapy model. And then more recently, um, I have jumped into the transhumanism uh, discussion, and in particular, radical life extension in, in religion. Okay. Yeah, one thing I want to make clear here now, you're a religious studies scholar. Now, are you a man of the cloth, per, let's say? Uh, no, I am not ordained. Oh, okay. No, I'm, I'm an academic. Okay, an academic religious scholar, but I, you're... You would consider. I think I under, uh, I, excuse me. I think I. I mean, I have uh, connections within the uh, faith communities, and I think I. I under, understand that community, but I'm. I'm not a. a um, clergy not, person. Not a clergy person, but you would consider no. yourself a man of faith. Uh, yes, my own uh, religious orientation is. Um, rather non-traditional. Um, I would say Christian influenced pretty heavily by um, elements of Hinduism and with leanings toward particularly monasticism, which I've done some work in in various projects, and um, certain um, mystical traditions as okay. classically understood. All right, I understand. All right, uh, first question I have for you tonight is with something that many of us often encounter when we're talking with religious people and we bring up this topic of extreme life extension or cryonics or transhumanism. And there is an instant, visceral rejection of all of this type of thought and all of this type of uh, activity 
uh, with the Immortality Institute, it seems, I would say, 99% of religious people uh, automatically uh, turn it away, and, and they and they don't want anything to do with it. And I've asked this of other people, um, um, you know, clergy people, uh, different religious people, of why uh, that reaction occurs. Where, I mean, because I grew up as, uh, ra I was raised a Catholic, and, you know, what... I, as far as looking in the Bible, I can find nothing that would justify an immediate rejection of um, life extension, or even extreme life extension, or transhumanism. And I just want to get your perspective on why do we encounter such resistance. Um, well, uh, the first point I would make is that uh, um, I don't think you get that resistance from all religious folk. Not from all, that is correct. I'm going mainly with Judeo-Christian tradition since that is what I'm most right. familiar with and I live in the United States and that's where I get most of my perspective from, just for everyone, uh, you know, just where I'm coming from so everyone knows. Right. Well, um, I would say that um, there are a number of things to consider. Uh, one is that uh, conservative Christians, maybe like all of us, are influenced by our mentors or uh, people that we look to. And so life extension, and you mentioned Quranics, is a scientifically based enterprise. And so the people who are, at least in, were initially involved in, in life extension were religiously, I guess you would say, or in terms of their philosophical orientation, were atheists or agnostics primarily, certainly not conservative Christians. Right. And so conservative Christians, when they look and see that this is a science-based enterprise, uh, they have an aversion, first of all, to science, a long uh, history of opposition to science in a, kind of a conservative and traditional Christian setting. And... Uh, um, they're, they look and they see who's involved, and it's not people that they want to emulate. Um, secondly, they're opposed to change, and we're talking about a pretty significant change here in terms very, of these very therapies significant. and technologies, and so change is threatening to people, and particularly people who have a more traditional mindset, where the, whether it's politically or religiously uh, traditional, okay. they're, I think, threatened by change. And so the change, they react, and when they react, they move into their comfort zone, which for conservative Christians is their kind of theological um, belief system and their um, community of faith network. Okay, so, yeah. so they have an initial reaction against um, um, against this, I think. Now, of course, one of the points I want to make is that is that I predict that that's going to change. But oh. you may want to a ask about that in another question. Yes. I think that's my yes. initial take on why there's such resistance. Okay. Yeah. Change and uh, uh, the, the kind of their uh, uh, you know they don't uh, take to science as well as right. what would atheists or agnostics yeah change so yeah and w what can uh, uh, people who are involved with the immortality institute or uh, the transhumanism or chronics do to prevent uh, uh, negative reactions uh, from uh, the, the, the large uh, numbers of Christian people uh, that are out there that uh, may be encountering this type of thing uh, for the first time. I know, uh, anyway, a little story about Elcor in um, uh, Arizona. There, uh, you know, people want, you know, there are some people that hold the view that those people should be defrosted or devitrified, deanimated, and uh, uh, and buried or cremated. You know, they have that strong of a you know reaction against cryonics uh, that they would uh, rather have them buried, you know, taken out of their... Uh, uh, frozen state and, and buried, and I just want to know what uh, what's what would be most effective in your view uh, to uh, you know get along better with uh, the vast majority of uh, Christian people that are out there, especially in the United States. Well, the first thing I would say is that's a good question for the life extension community to ask because as as this 
conversation emerges into the broader culture, it is emerging into a diverse culture, 